not only they sack Rome, which was an really ins insignificant city at the time, but they also destroyed Etruscan league or Etruscan cities. Etruscans were a very, very powerful civilization north of Rome, and they were the only power that kept the Romans in, uh, in line. Same time, more or less, but the main Macedonian wars happened after the Hannibal. Right. Uh, one for the... It's so interesting because uh, this is what I found out when I was creating the map video. Like, it's it's uh, the uh, history of the Roman Empire every month and Caesar gets angry because this is the greatest thing about Julius Caesar that he did not put emotions into his uh, political actions. So what he sees right now is a uh, dead Roman and dead especially Roman consul and he being slain by... Uh, Someone else than a Roman doesn't matter if they were Egyptians or barbarians or whatever. And he just sees this and he flips out and you know uh, decides that he will not make any deals with him. And you know this Pompey and his sister Cleopatra are fighting for uh, for, for uh, who's gonna be the uh, the pharaoh of, uh, of Egypt, Constantine. Eventually he was baptized. So. The question whether he adopted Christianity out of uh, it was opportunism, or he really believed in Jesus Christ. I think both, but for him it was of course important. He was an emperor, and he needed something unifying for the whole empire. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And I'm with Thomas Maximus, who I discovered a few months ago, and your channel is awesome, by, by the way. It's one of my go-tos for learning about the Roman Empire, but also enjoying it and having a laugh. Uh, you do a, throw a lot of memes in there. Um, I'm going to throw play some clips later on, but um, thanks for coming on. And you know, thank you for having me. It's great to be here, and yeah. thank you for, for thank you for the promo. Yeah, we were having a little discussion before we hit the record button, and uh, that alone could have been a nice little ten minute segment because we were talking about Caesar Augustus, talking about the Civil War, talking about Mark Antony, the show Rome, how it was depicted, um, and then so I want to get into sort of the sort of phases of the Roman Empire from the from the um from the republic to the empire and then to the christian era so i don't know let's start off with let's go back to the roman republic and how exactly do we get from the time of i don't know pompey the great the republic to augustus where there's an emperor a dictator basically if you will mm -hmm. how would you um describe how the events that took place in that I think uh, when we talk about the Republic, uh, if you go, you mean the early stages of the Republic, when, like when it started. Yeah. I think the Ro Roman Republic basically starts in 390 or 387 BC when Gauls sacked the, the Rome. Uh, because everything beforehand basically is just myths. And the Gallic, it, it's a paradox, but it also supports the narrative that I'm pushing that uh, Romans were not that great at winning battles, they were great at losing them. Because they had this almost infinite amount of soldiers they were willing to sacrifice to, to achieve the ultimate victory. And it starts, I think their history really starts with the Gallic sack of Rome in 387 or 390 BC. It's disputed which date it really was. And uh, what that Gallic sacking did was that not only they sacked Rome, which was really ins insignificant city at the time, but they also destroyed Etruscan league or Etruscan cities. That and Etruscans were a very, very powerful uh, civilization north of Rome, and they were the only power that kept the uh, Romans in uh, in line. 
And you know, Romans were always known and being they were known for being fierceful. They were great warriors, but they were always so overman. It was a city state, and they were overwhelmed uh, and controlled by Etruscans. Mm. And not only Gauls destroyed uh, or sacked Rome, but they also destroyed Etruscans, and they created this power vacuum for the Roman uh, Republic to rise. And you know, if you consider some other things like the population boost that uh, happened across to Europe, uh, a population explosion uh, that lasted till uh, first century uh, AD. Then Romans also had a significant population boost. So while other Mediterranean nations more or less stagnated, especially Greeks, then Romans still had this large population uh, uh, that, you know, they were willing, as I said, they were willing to sacrifice a huge amount of soldiers and they were just new babies were born every year, more than, more than uh, in... They were thriving. Yeah, they were thriving. Yeah, this and, is what I... So the Etruscans are these elite group of people living in Italy. And yeah. how, how does that, how do they, do they fizzle out? What happens with them? Well, uh, Etruscans are one of the most unknown. Uh, for example, their uh, their language has not yet been uh, translated. This is a very interesting fact about them. It looks like what, a it looks like a mix between Latin and like Indo-European. You can't tell what it look. It looks like a combination of both. Like yeah, I, I, I find I it. I find it so fascinating that even today, with those technologies that we have at our disposal, we are not able to translate. Uh, the language and uh, yeah, it was the Roman Emperor Claudius that was uh, that wrote some uh, Etruscan books that are unfortunately lost forever. Uh, those might have helped us to translate the language, but it was a very um, powerful. I wouldn't say I mean, it was a state; but it was a group of city states, but they were very powerful, uh, very were thriving, and what. You know, they were all basically controlling Rome. Uh, most of its Roman kings, uh, of course, they are Romulus, but Romulus is probably uh, probably just a myth. But there were a lot of Etruscan kings that controlled uh, Rome. And, They're like the elite class, basically. Yeah, they were elite class that was destroyed uh, through the Gallic invasion, and it op opened up the they created a power vacuum and Romans where the uh, Roman Republic was there to fill in the, uh, the vacuum. And so what, what happens first? Is it Hannibal or is it the Macedonian war that happens first? Not, I forgot which one it is. Uh, they happen at the same time, more or less, but the main Macedonian wars happened after the Hannibal. Okay. In, uh, one for the, uh, sig but they were, they were, it's, it's so, it's so interesting because, uh, this is what I found out when I was creating the map video, like it's, it's you know, the, uh, history of the Re Roman empire every month. And it also opened my eyes. Oh my God. How... I watched that video. I watched the video yeah. like 10 times already because the music, you, the, the music you threw in there is awesome by the way. And I'll, if I'm reading, yeah. I'll be reading like old Tacitus or something and I'll throw that on in the background and listen to it while I'm. It's perfect. It's, and then I'll, dude, you did a great, by the way, how long did that take you to make that video? Cause you, year. you have every single month shown from, from what? 700 BC to yeah. like 700 AD, right? 580. Uh, like that. And I have no idea how I pulled it off. It's, it's just, wow. When I watched it, it was like, oh man, when did I find the time to do all this? It's a masterpiece though. And it's, what is it got? Like a million views Thank you. or something like that? Uh, I think it's uh 800 000, something like this well deserved that's for sure it's a good video thanks uh what but uh so just let me get back quickly what yeah. i was Sorry. saying about the video that uh the second punic war uh that was led uh was between the roman republic and uh hannibal uh it's so interesting that what again it, it was just uh just like we uh talked about uh before the recording uh, that there are some parts of uh, history that through Shakespeare we don't know about. What we know that Hannibal went uh, to Italy, he defeated Romans in three, three, four battles. Battle of Cannae, wow, total chaos. Uh, Hannibal is stuck in Italy. Bam, then he goes to Africa and is defeated by Scipio. Uh, 
what we tend to forget that there were three battlefields. There was not only in Italy, but Romans were fighting also in Hispania. They were, they were okay, we're not able probably to defeat Hannibal, so we are gonna attack his allies and uh, his uh, domains in Hispania. So they, and Hispania is battlefield on its own. And also, as you mentioned, Macedon, uh, Macedonia was uh, ally of, at, at, for a certain period of time of Carthage. So they tried to defeat, uh, or, or they defeated Mes Macedonia as well. So there were one, two, three, uh, eventually there were four battlefields <laughs> Romans had to fight on. And it's so unfreaking believable they were able to win the war eventually before all the disaster that happened in Italy. And what's so, what's so amazing about this is that Macedonia was famous after the backs of what happened to Alexander the Great, Diodaci Wars happened, Ptolemy Empire, Seleucid Empire, mm -hmm. but Macedonia still sort of was the hegemon of the West because they controlled the Phoenician fleet, which was in Carthage at that time. And so Carthage and Macedonia are pretty much in control of all the West. And Rome, against all odds, defeats both Macedon and Carthage yeah. and becomes the hegemon of the West for the, mm -hmm. for the next thousand years, basically. Like it does. Yeah, change. yeah. And that, like you said, it's really amazing how that played out because it could have went, it could have went sideways pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's towards the narrative that I'm pushing that Romans were so great at losing battles, that they just didn't, it didn't matter. Hey, uh, are we gonna fight the Romans? Because you know, they are gonna win eventually. They will send, they're just gonna spawn their troops over and over. And you know, do we have the same will? to win this war against them as they do against us? Uh, the answer is no, because the Romans, there was no option to lose a war, right. at, at least in, in the early stages of the of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. Right. They just kept sending more and more troops. Yeah. So, and so, okay, and so, so then all of a sudden, we get to Emilius, Paul, Paul, Emilius Paulus, was that his name? Where he's the one who conquers Macedonia, Rome takes over, and then it's from him and Scipio, and then down to Pompey the Great, who focuses attention on the east. He goes in and conquers all of Turkey, all of Judea. Mm. He goes into the Temple of Jerusalem, and they're like, "If you go in there, Yahweh's going to stomp you. Up. Well, Yahweh's going to smite you on the spot. You, you can't go in there." And Pompey the Great goes, "Watch what I do. <laughs> Want to bet? Watch." He goes right in yeah. there. Nothing happens. He sacks the temple, and he goes into Egypt, and and so he becomes famous because now he's the man. He's Pompey the Great now. But uh, there is a power struggle, and now all of a sudden there's what it's called the first triumvirate. Caesar is gaining popularity because he goes into Gaul, he conquers Gaul. Crassus is just rich, so he just becomes he's just by default the third one. And what happens next? What happens with this third triumvirate? Everything seems all good and dandy. And then what happens? Well, uh, it's just uh, one side note that I want to mention is about uh, Pompey and what we we are today. What we see in Caesar uh, is created by by Shakespeare. It's created by HBO Rome and other shows. But we tend to forget how Pompey was, uh, how great Pompey was. He was, was literally Pompey the Great, but it's, we neglect this person so much. Uh, because he, the amount of territories that he conquered is just Unreal. beyond our comprehension. And you know, when you look at Caesar and they say, eh, he just conquered his goal. Okay, it's, it's just France, basically, just France, you know. Uh, what, there is the one, Roma? There is one writer who makes this very clear, and that's um, Lucan, the writer Lucan who writes the Civil War. Lucan, mm -hmm. Lucan lets it be known in the beginning of those four chapters that Pompey the Great is the greatest. Caesar is second to Pompey the Great. And then the Civil War is what makes Caesar great. But Caesar's Rome, the, the, the Rome that Caesar inherits is off the building back of what Pompey the Great establishes. Pompey the Great is the one who does everything. He does all the hard work and then the Civil War happens and then Caesar just happens to win. But if it wasn't for Pompey the Great, Rome would not be Rome. If I, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Or well, I agree that uh, Pompey and Caesar, they uh, both of them made made Rome great, and of course they fought one another. But 
uh, it's just the breaks, you know. I, I think that both of them are pretty important for the Roman history. Uh, Caesar was lucky enough to be to conquer. For when he conquered Gaul, I think we look at Gaul and say, "Hey, you know, it's not such a large territory as what Pompey conquered." But Gaul was for Romans; it was something mysterious. Right. They did not know how how, how Gaul. They, they were known. That they knew that there were some tribes, but they were aware of how today's Turkey, Middle East, how, how it looks like, how many cities there are. But Gaul, right. it was it was it was unconquerable. The same way we think about Germania, hey, Roman Empire conquered Germania. Man, that's impossible because it not, right. did not happen. But for contemporary Romans before the, uh, Julius Caesar, it was the same way with Gaul. They did not think that Gaul is conquerable and then bam. Because Alexander the Great conquered what Pompey uh had conquered what pompey uh, also conquered so it was achievable they knew that hey middle east can be conquered alexander the great had done it before pompey okay but gold man you cannot conquer gold it's just wow this is mysterious land and you know we, we think of uh, hey territory was not that large but romans did not have the maps that we we have today so for them it was also a pretty huge chunk of territory yeah it's like it's like this giant area of enchanted woods and yeah druids out there and then you got britain who they didn't know how big britain was yeah there, yeah there were rumors that britain was in another continent the size of europe but that yeah. uh, wasn't true but still the the story the moral of the story is it, like you said it was mysterious it was unconquered uncharted mm. unmapped uh herodotus when he talks about the north he talks about the uh the um we are, what does he say? That he calls them the uh, Hyperboreans. Mm. He says they have one eye. There's, yeah, yeah. Old guarding griffins up there flying around, these flying lions. So he doesn't know what the hell is going on. This is a complete mysterious world to them. And they're just, yeah. they're just making shit up. Like they don't even know what it is. Yeah, but, I think it, Levy even said it, uh, that for some people think that Britain is a myth. It, it just yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah. Hey, I was in Britain. Yeah. It, and, I'm sure you were in the Gallic Caesar in Caesar's Gallic War. It says where when they got to Britain, there was Roman soldiers that lost bets because they thought it wasn't there, and they were, yeah. like, <laughs> they were shocked. They're like, "Oh my God, it's real! This place yeah. is real!" So that's that's funny. That's that's that's, that's funny to see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Britain. I mean, yeah. Just this is why the goal was so important for Caesar that he uh, became a legend by by conquering this uh, this land and for for him it was also uh the reason why he won the war against pompey and well he did not win war against crassus who had been killed already right. by the time that this two, two started horrible. fighting right. yeah i mean this this is uh it, it's this old saying that probably that not every challenge that you take you you, you should do it because crassus was probably not he defeated Spartacus, yes, but he wasn't some great conqueror. And when you think, when I, I forgot, but it was the battle where Parthians defeated his legions, a battle of Car Carhe, I think it was. Yeah, it might have been Carhe, yeah. Yeah, and it's in, it's like Western Syria. It's not like in the middle of a freaking desert. He was right. <laughs> it was. It was not that he was in the middle of enemy territory or anything like this. It was defeated pretty quickly so yeah, it was caesar the great commander who had and another famous person from this era was was mithridates Mithrid yeah five or was it four i think i think it's mithridates four i think it was super six. famous or, no yeah. it was six you're right i'm sorry yeah but he was super famous he was they thought that he was the success he was a, a descendant of both alexander and cyrus and yeah, he, yeah. He goes around and winning battles and winning battles, and then Pompey the Great beats him. So by the, by the time you get to the Civil War, and by the way, Lucan does a great job of depicting how important the Civil mm. War was. By the time you get to the Civil War, you have Pompey the Great, who just is like just got his whole career is just winning against military geniuses like Mithridates, and winning all these territory, and then Caesar, who's like the new the new like the new hero, he just wins in Gaul. And like this are two super giants. Basically, think about it like this: the WWE World Wrestling Federation Champion, yeah. 
at the end of the year when you have the two belt matches this was it this was like the world was all watching yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly exactly uh, like this. But you know, I think the Pompey had a disadvantage that he was living of his past glories, because by the time they, he was fighting Caesar, uh, it some time had already passed between his uh, famous conquest of, uh, of the Middle East and he was in the Senate for a long time. He was getting yeah. soft, getting soft while Caesar was out at war, getting hardened. So yeah, Caesar was war ready. Whereas Pompey was, he was he was becoming an aristocrat, basically. Yeah, the, the Gallic War had been uh, solved in I, th I think in 53 BC, and in 52 started uh, the civil war. So Caesar had a pretty clear war experience or new war experience, while Pompey was. Uh, it's 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 harsh to say he was getting soft, but yeah, it. I, Probably he was getting south, yeah, in, in in the Senate. There also was a really important battle in the Navy, in the sea, that Brutus won. Brutus was yeah. credited for winning the battle, and that was a turning point in that civil war. And there's a lot of historians say that if Brutus didn't win that battle for Caesar, Pompey could have won the whole entire civil war. It was that was that much of a turning point. And that mm. after that after that uh, naval battle, a lot of gen a lot of the generals from Pompey's side went to caesar and said okay you we, you you win we mm. we retreat so then that led caesar that led <clears throat> pompey to go on the run into greece or into wherever he went and uh but yeah that i think that was a big turning point yeah and, and you know the thing about caesar is that he was really a genius in a way that he, he knew how to manipulate with people uh he was uh what i would call magnanimous he was willing to grant pardon to those who forgave all went to him yeah he forgave all of them and it was a really smart move and he probably relied too much on his uh, sp uh speech abilities it was, he was a great uh he was a great order. speaker yeah or order yeah and you know some, sometimes this is interesting when you watch that his legions always tend to mutiny at some point at some point and then caesar comes with this I what I would call a little gay speech from, from from the South Park or like like yeah Cartman says oh no you're gonna Cartman says to Kyle oh no you're gonna give one of those gay speeches again uh so this is what I think that Roman Senate and Pompey thought whenever Caesar's legions wanted to mutiny and then Caesar comes with this little gay speech and ah yeah well everything's okay, okay. <laughs> but um yeah but that's what that's what Caesar was able to do yeah, he was able to use his his leadership skills to to sway. To, he basically changes, turns the republic into an empire. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the next thing that happened. So, we might as well get into this chapter now. So, Pompey the Great, after the war is over, he flees to Egypt, where it's like what is it, Ptolemy ten at that time? Was it the ten mm. Ptolemy? And they they decapitate him. And mm. oh, mm. no one knows about this yet. So Caesar's going to find him. He goes out to uh, Egypt to find him, and they serve Caesar, the head of Pompey the Great, on a platter. And then what <laughs> happens after that? Yeah, well, uh, as, as we all know, the, he, Caesar gets angry because uh, this is the greatest thing about Julius Caesar, that he did not put emotions into his uh, political actions. So what he sees right now is a uh, dead Roman. Right. And dead especially uh, roman consul and he being slain by uh, someone else than a roman doesn't matter if they were egyptians or barbarians or whatever and he just sees this and he flips out and you know uh decides that he will not make any deals with these and any deal with these people and you know this pompey and his sister cleopatra are fighting for uh for, for uh who's gonna be the uh, the pharaoh of, uh, of Egypt, well, he probably decides that he's gonna, the best way to go is gonna go with uh, Cleopatra than with someone who will betray you when things do not go that well. Which is something what Pompey did to, uh, to uh, what, um, what was, I forgot it is um, pharaoh's name. Uh, yeah, Pompey was killed by, by, by Egyptians, so this is what... Uh, right. Yeah, he 
did not trust those people and he probably decided yes a little switch of government will be in order and then do you know that lucan i keep bringing up lucan because he's fresh in my mind the, the the next scene after this happens in his depiction of this is that julius caesar gives an apotheosis to pop to pompey which is they made him a god and he mm. puts on a puts him on a funeral pyre and he um he uh what's the call when you burn um when you you know they they throw him they they light him on fire basically yeah, yeah. On fire. and they deify him he becomes deified and he becomes yeah, deified. Part of, becomes part of the roman imperial cult and people are actually worshiping pompey for the next like 100 years yeah yeah well another reason why caesar was so great because pompey was dead there was no willpower to to uh you know make him more unpopular so you know right. he, he made knew. friends out of enemies and when the enemy is dead well and yeah he knew that was a good he knew that'd be a good idea to get yeah the, to get pompey supporters to be his supporter what's a better idea than to deify pompey mm. i'm the one who does it so now people are like oh look at caesar's actually who we like so it works in his favor he becomes basically the next he's now the sole dictator of rome at this point yeah, but uh, th there is also the great Eastern influence that he gets from Egypt. And this is uh, something that I think it really kind of destroyed the Roman Empire eventually or the Western Roman Empire, because it was the Eastern way of thinking, because uh, Western was more or less um, uh, in in pro individual. Uh, yeah. And while the East was like dom dominant, yeah, it was this principate versus dominant, and dominant was pretty uh, popular in the Eastern uh, in the Eastern Roman Empire or in the East. And every 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 single emperor, including Caesar, uh, who went to went to the Eastern part of the empire, Syria, Egypt, those people deified those living emperors and they always they always they loved it they always wow what in the west i'm just you know prince one of the many but here i'm i'm almost a god for these people right and this is why east even though east was defeated uh in the battle of actium by octavian against mark anthony and west eventually western way of thinking eventually prevails over the east and east um go um uh eventually reconquers the western western rome by his way of thinking that but through the roman emperors that love to be perceived as gods in the east and this is why uh, principate is eventually dominated by uh dominate yeah and so it's funny that you mentioned that because that's a good point because mark antony even though we look at him as being in the shadow of caesar he really was extremely powerful between him and Lepidus. Mm. By the way, people don't realize Marcus Lepidus. We were talking about the show Rome. Yeah, I cannot stand how they depict him in that show. Yeah, he yeah, was, I agree. He was the Pontifus Maximus, which is like today's version of the Pope. He mm. should, he had so much power, especially right after Caesar, when Caesar died, when the third, when the second triumvirate came around. We'll talk about uh antony and, and augustus yeah, they never yeah. talk about how powerful lepidus was and lepidus could have really made a a, a a run for it but he sort of cowered to augustus weirdly mm. he, augustus sort of just says all right go away and let i'm gonna be the sole emperor but i'll let you live but go but lepidus if re i think if you really wanted to he could have made his own stab at the at the vow for power but i don't think he wanted it i think he just didn't care well, uh, Lepidus at one point tried to fight against uh, Octavian, but you know, he was pretty quickly defeated. Right. But uh, you know, in the show, it's also depicted: Hey, you're gonna, you know, what what part of the empire I get? And so, ah, you're gonna get Africa. It's just you know embarrassing. But Africa and today's uh, Tunisia, Algeria, uh, it was one of the richest part of the uh, Roman yeah. Empire. So Are he you? got the best part, while I think Octavian uh got you know goal at first which was newly reconquered newly conquered and 
it was not really that rich so he had all the he had all the legions in it but he did not get the best part of the empire that he could get well i'm, I'm calling it empire right now um, it's it was not at the time it was not a roman empire but i think it's, uh, it's turning into it yeah it, and then anthony gets the east yeah which is like well, that's a big it, section right there too yeah, this is another thing that I found out when I was making those that map video that there were three different splits of the empire. That uh, at first Mark Anthony got basically everything except for uh, I think Gaul, Hispania, and Italy, and eventually they switched those provinces between them. And eventually the third split was what we what we know from the HBO Rome that uh, Lepidus got Africa, uh, um, Octavian got Hispania and Gaul, and Mark Anthony got everything uh, east, uh, eastward of uh, Italy. Italy was like belonged to the, still belonged to the Senate, but more or less it was then controlled by Octavian. I want to ask you about the situation when Caesar gets assassinated so okay so you got cicero and brutus and the i don't know there's like a hundred of them i guess mm. um conspirators and they kill caesar and then he caesar is so brilliant that he he it's not that he saw it coming but he precautioned himself in case it happened his will the way mm. his will is written is he gives all the wealth to the to the armies to the, to the people he gives all of the all of his riches and wealth goes to the people in the armies, basically the, the legions. But he also makes Augustus his son by yeah. adoption. And I wonder what you think about the dynamic that happens as soon as Caesar gets killed, the will it gets read. Caesar or Augustus is his son, but if I'm not mistaken, right away Augustus is actually siding with uh, Cicero, doesn't he? Yeah, it's true. Uh, well, he needed the support of the Roman Senate, even though they were the ones who assassinate, ass assassinated uh, Caesar. But it, another thing about Caesar that he picked Octavian, who was, I don't know, he was 17, 18, he was really young. Yeah. But he saw something in him, something special. Though this is why he, he declared him as his heir. Which immediately uh, Octavian utilized that he started using that he was I think it was Julius Caesar Octavian right. <laughs> immediately utilized his uh, adoptive father's name, so uh, I think he probably saw that Octavian is a genius. So this this is the great thing about Caesar that he knew how to he knew. pick his people around him, although it eventually it got him killed. But uh, it was even though you know we think oh Caesar was killed well i think he was immortalized by being murdered in a senate by by his so-called friend so he this is what i think most of the romans also wanted to achieve was immortality what caesar achieved through this uh, assassination and by the way when he gets when he gets deified same situation as as pompey he gets a funeral pyre he gets deified yeah. there's a comet in the sky and they think the comet is the god venus who is coming down to take caesar and brings him up to heaven. This is according to um, uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis. The last book mm. of Ovid's Metamorphosis is called The Deification of Julius Caesar. And immediately after this, he's deified. He's not only deified, but he's they're considering him one of the primary gods. Like he's like one of the biggest gods. And and this gives Augustus a title of Divius Eli or Divius Filius, the son of God. Mm. So he is the son of God. While yeah. He, while, while Caesar has passed away. Yeah, this is what we neglect today, that how those signs were extremely important for the for the Romans, for the Greeks, for everyone who left, lived at the time. So, so one single comet meant everything. It was, everything, right. Some, some, sometimes it was a bad omen, sometimes it was a good omen. No, nobody really like was certain, but for them it was extremely, extremely important. And it was up to the Pontus Maximus to decide what the omen meant. And they would yeah. they would go to the Sibylline oracles and they would they would read the oracles and they'd say, okay, this is a bad omen or this is a good omen. And Marcus Lepidus is actually the is the Pontifus Maximus when Julius Caesar dies, which I think is interesting because now now you have Mark Antony, who's the military commander who knows all the military. You have Caesar or um, Augustus Caesar, who's he's got the will, he's the son of God, and then you have Lepidus, who's the Pontifus Maximus. So now you had this triumvirate. And how do you, my question is, how do we get from 
Augustus siding with um, Cicero and the conspirators to him siding with um, Antony and Lepidus. Uh, it was, I think it was that he wanted to be a consul. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if I remember this part of the history correctly. He was, he wanted to become a consul and, uh, the Senate was like, okay, you're too young to be a consul, uh, which basically was not, well, it, it was true that he was, uh, but it, it was not the real reason. The, they were scared that he had too much power. Became yeah, he was scared. They, they were scared he was gonna get too much power, and of course, the Senate wanted to be like the fourth person to play to to jump from uh, Lepidus to Octavian to Mark Antony and just you know survive and uh, keep its power. But eventually, they make this one bad bad step that they uh, refuse to back Octavian. What Octavian does that he totally jumps over the Senate and goes to Lepidus directly and uh, to Mark Anthony, and they make this unholy alliance. And then within a year, if I'm not mistaken, within one year, all the conspirators are dead. So so this, yeah. so for the people who are Roman Imperial cult worshipers, what they saw, what they witnessed, is they witnessed Caesar avenge himself from the grave through his will that he wrote before he got killed to hmm. Augustus, who avenges his death. So what they're seeing is a, a miracle. Like they're like Caesar is God. They're like he just avenged himself from the grave. Wow, this is insane. No one's ever seen anything like it. But but what's even crazier is the next forty years, Augustus is like invincible. Yeah. So you have to think like if you're a Roman living in this time period and you're watching these events, Ovid, for example, you read Ovid, Virgil, read Virgil, all these writers. They're talking about Augustus as if he is the, the greatest thing that ever happened. He is a mm -hmm. great God, basically. Yeah. You can't blame him because look at the, look what happened. You know? Yeah, he was, uh, he was extremely powerful. And uh, I think with, he had also a big dose of luck and he had a great people around. I think it was also a triangle. It was him. It was Agrippa. And uh, I forgot his wife's name. Also, Livia, I think, was yeah. uh, his wife's name. And they were, he was willing to cooperate with them because he wasn't a great commander. When uh, I think when he fought against Mark Antony, he did not personally fight in that battle. He wasn't. He was not a great commander. And you know, it, it also has something to do that he was. Um, prone to getting ill pretty quickly. So, you know, when, when you're in the military, you need to be pretty fit to uh, to march 30, 50 kilometers somewhere with the 30 kilograms on your back. So uh, this is not what uh, Octavian really was. So he had a, a grip off of it. And to maintain his family and, uh, of course, they were power hungry as well. So he had his wife for that. Yeah, and Mark, yeah. Mark, like you said, Marcus, Mark Agrippa, is really like the the the, the backbone of this new new era, because he mm. he's like a military, like you say, he's a military genius. And they come away with Antony rebels against them, so does Lepidus. Lepidus, they let they let him live, but Mark Antony, he does not want. He does he's relentless. He wants yeah. to take Rome for himself, so he sets up in Egypt with Cleopatra. And he starts his own little regime over there. But Augustus comes out triumphant in that one, too. It's interesting that we tend to think that uh, Mark Anthony was like the enemy of Rome and Augustus successfully uh, persuaded the Roman Senate against Mark Anthony. But when the war broke out between, the, between uh, uh, Octavian and uh, Mark Anthony, I think like 40% of Roman senators uh, just left Rome and joined Mark Anthony because they believe that he yeah. is the true ruler, which is which, which is interesting because what Mark Anthony had done was really egregious. That he a lot of the provinces that he got, Roman provinces, he basically granted them to, to Cleopatra. I don't know if it, it, it was probably I don't I would I would call it the simping because there is no other word for it. I don't know why why he did it, but it was basically a death sentence for him. Uh, he was enchanted by Cleopatra, probably. Yeah, he was he was really trying to set up satraps around the Eastern Roman Empire. 
yeah. different different provinces like Syria and Judea, and he he really was trying to, and like you said, he was extremely popular too. People mm-hmm. liked Mark Antony. He had his he had the history at behind on his side. People knew who he was, and he was always a Roman. So, mm. and I mean, it's like we think of in America, you got the Democrats and Republicans, and on one side the Republicans are bad, and the other side Democrats are bad. But mm. they're both American, and they both have their ideas. And but it's like yeah. that's how that's how the split was back then. It was just two different splits of of the same empire. Yeah, and the only difference was that Octavian won. Octavian, won, right. yeah, yeah. Always the the, the, the the history is written by the victors. Yeah. Uh, Octavian was successful in his propaganda against Mark Anthony, and Octavian won. This is yeah. This is how this is how it ended. Mark, if Mark Mark Anthony had won, it would it would be the Eastern dominance that I mentioned. He would be probably the next pharaoh of of Rome. But you know what? Uh, yeah. You know what's interesting about Mark Antony is, even though he loses, if I'm not mistaken, the the Antonine dynasty from the second mm. from the second century are all descended from Mark Antony's bloodline in some way. So he marries into the like his. Bl- the people related to Mark Antony are still in the royal sort of family. They're still the Roman emperors are, are all. I mean, they're all related. Like you got Tiberius is related to Augustus and Nero is the grandson, and and their that whole bloodline, the Julia Claudian bloodline is. And then you get the Vespasian era, but the, but but uh, Mark Antony's ancestor or descendants are still staying at a high level in government. For the next hundred years, and when you, when you get to the Mark or the Antonine Dynasty, they're, they're actually, from if I'm not mistaken, that Antonine Dynasty has some sort of blood relation to Mark Antony. I'm not really sure about the blood um, bloodline, uh, to be honest, because Roman emperors always tended to create then their own fake bloodlines. Good point. And Adopt. Uh, Adopt. yeah, for, for them, it was it was really important to. You know, today, what you want to have to uh, that you want to say, hey, I am a self-made man. I have, you know, my father gave me nothing, and I started off with nothing. But I, you know, what I created is all on on, on my own. In the Roman Empire, it was really different. Uh, it didn't matter who you are, but also always important who your ancestors were. So this is why uh, Barak emperors, especially with with no no background whatsoever so they always needed to create some fake bloodlines to promote them as hey you know what that, that our our my my bloodline is 300 400 500 years old so and you yeah. and uh, yeah why the why the last roman ever was named romulus because he had no heritage whatsoever so his father named him romulus no, that's a really good point that you just brought up. Is that I shouldn't have said bloodline. I should have said genealogy because yeah. they're, they're not. They're all adopted. They're all all, and that's it's weird because, if I'm not mistaken, Vespasian and Titus are like one of the only son and father son Vespasian and Titus yeah. yeah for like the next hundred years. Like, there's like no real father son. I think Commodus was a real son, though, right? Or, or, yeah, yeah, Commodus. It, it, it's such a good point, good point that you're bringing up because I was always thinking about it. Why did not they have any sons? Those freaking emperors. Oh. Uh, they had sons, but they usually had died before they, their father. They would uh, just adopt the next yeah. thing. Whoever was the next up and coming rich kid, next seventeen yeah. year old kid in his prime, I'm adopting him to be my heir, and that was. Yeah. That's actually, that was actually a smart thing they did back then. They, yeah, yeah. Later on, the English and French empires, they didn't do that. It was it went right to the bloodline son. And mm. that, that was, I think, a bad thing that happened to Europe was all these families running things. But whereas in the Romans, they would find whoever is the best fit and say, mm. okay, I like, I like Tiberius. Or Augustus would say this. This Tiberius kid, I like him. I'm going to adopt him. He's the next Roman Empire. That's probably smarter than some rich kid who just lives in a mansion his whole life. You know what I mean? Yeah, probably. But uh, Augustus probably at the time when he adopted Tiberius uh, had ran out of uh, of uh, people that he could <laughs> declare his uh, heirs. So, uh, and you know, it 
It is very extraordinary what happened in the second century AD that, you know, this, because it was Trajan adapted, um, Hadrian, Hadrian adapted, uh, Antoninus and Antoninus adapted Mark Aurelius. So this is extraordinary. But in the third century, what you have, uh, you know, the crisis of the third century, that each emperor wants to create their own uh, bloodline yeah. through their own sons. Like I said, that's always and always <laughs> ends with the with the second generation. The son son gets killed, and and and, and of the uh, Roman uh, of, of, of their emperor blood uh, emperor's bloodline. Right. It's fascinating. I mean, Valer, Valerian was one of the emperors that uh, you know. Valerian had I don't know four sons. Yeah. One of only one of them. Uh, became uh, the Roman Emperor. It was Gallienus, and the th uh, the other three, I don't know, two or three sons, got killed. <laughs> Basically, they were murdered, or they died of disease, or whatever. But lifespan of Roman emperors and also of Roman heirs was very, very short. And Constantine's four sons tried to. They couldn't hold it together either, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's true. Well, well, the Crispus was uh, already killed by Constantine. For, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, if yeah, you I remember, saw, yeah, I saw that in your this... video. You cut it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and, um, uh, there was probably the relationship between uh, his son and um, his stepmom, Constantine's wife. It's one of the theories. Uh, but the, but the three sons, yeah, they really uh, fought <laughs> against one another, and it and ended up and the Dyn Constantine dynasty ended uh, with them. I want to ask you. I ask everybody this that comes on my channel because this is really the mystery: is how do you go from Vespasian and Nero, the, the the year of the four empires, the year of the four emperors, and the war against Judea, and how Rome hates the Jews? Basically, how do you go from that type of empire to three centuries later, Christianity takes over the Roman Empire. How do you? I know, I know, it's a long period of time, and it yeah. slowly happens. But like, and if, if you had to like sort of put this together and make sense of all this, what do you think happens? Uh, I think uh, Romans did not really hate Jews; they hated anyone that uh, rose up against them, and it was. It was really the, the issue wasn't who the, the nationality is. It was important was that they rose up against the power of Rome, and we need to defeat them. And Jews were really unruly, so they basically wiped them out. And the Jews, it was it was basically a Holocaust. I mean, if you yeah. look at how many Jews were killed in uh, the ovens of Auschwitz, and it was basically what Romans did in Jerusalem in seventy AD. And Bar Kokhba, they, they were not fucking around. Yeah, 130, Bar Kokhba, same thing. Masada, yeah, yeah. Masada, 74, slaughtered them. They were, yeah. they were constantly going in there and just sacking the all, whoever whoever the revolt was. Um, but if you actually re if you read the Talmud, there was a lot of Jews that were on the side of the Roman Empire that were saying, we don't like these these yeah. rebels. We're not with them. We don't, we're not with them. Here, help us out. And they actually wanted Rome to help them out. And there was actually... The 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 Yohanan, who was, I think he was a high priest, but he's in the Talmud, where he there's actually a the dialogue between him and Vespasian, where he sneaks out in the middle of the night and tells Vespasian, "Listen, these Sakari, they're making things crazy over here. We mm -hmm. have a, we have a bunch of a bunch of uh, rebels over here. We need you to help help us fix it. And by the way, uh, the Old Testament it it uh, talks about you. You're the you're you're the you're the you're the chosen one. So you're mm -hmm. like sort of like." puffs him up a little bit, gets him to like him, and it works. And then Vespasian, he's like, okay, fine, I won't, I'll le I'll spare you, and I'll send some doctors over to, to Yavni and uh, the sages over there. And basically what happens is these are the Jews that end up becoming the the uh, the Talmudic, um, what do you call them, the, not the second temple Jews, the next generation of Jews, the um, rabbinic Jews. Yeah. That's who are still around today. They're the surviving ones who, you know, did the right thing, I think. Yeah, uh, well, I think that one movie that really depicts this era uh, correctly, I think it's Ben Hur from 1959. It's one of the, my top favorite movies, and it shows how Jews were always concentrated on, and this is also what Christians uh, did and why they became the state's religion. They were focused on the afterlife. Yeah. And 
uh, while Romans were focused on, or pag Roman pagans were focused on the em Roman emperor, he's the god, we must, uh, well, not follow him blindly, but he's, he's, the, he's the creator of the world, basically, because, because the Roman empire or the contemporary Romans equals world. Yeah. There is no, there is no nothing beyond the Roman Empire. Even the barbaric lands were considered to be Roman or at least part of, part of the world. By the way, Philo, the first century philosopher, Jewish from Alexandria, him, who by the way, his daughter married the or his son, no, no, his son, yes, Philo's son marries the daughter of Agrippa, so she, he mm -hmm. carries into the royal Roman family. Josephus, who's adopted by Vespasian, also has a bunch of children, and they're named and they they're adopted into the Vespasian family as well. And they both, in their writings, say that Jove and Jehovah are the same God. So mm -hmm. Jupiter, Jupiter, Zeus, Jove, according to Josephus, and now Jews won't agree with this today, but these two in particular did. They said that that Jupiter. Or Job is the same deity. He's the supreme deity. Yeah, Yahweh. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I think they're setting up what the, I think what what happens with these people is they're starting to set up what come, becomes Christian theology. It's sort mm. of like it's sort of like a Hellenistic version of Judaism, whereas they look at Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament, but he's also more than that. He's also a world fulfillment. He's also the world Messiah for everyone, yeah, yeah. The Gentiles and the Jews. Well, what really helped Jesus was that he was kind of obscure by the time the, uh, Christianity became the state's religion. So they did not know much about Jesus, uh, but uh, it was enough for them to, to follow him and follow his teachings. Uh, I think the, one of the main, uh, except for Jesus, of course, the main spreader of the Christianity would be Titus who destroyed and his uh, father of Vespasian who destroyed Jerusalem because destruction of Jerusalem uh, it was really a destruction it was an annihilation of of the city the, the city then did not exist for for the next 40 years so all of the inhabitants had to go somewhere else including Christians and this is how Christians uh, ended up in various places around the Mediterranean. Yep. It's a really and good point. Is, yeah. That's a really good point. Like, that the diaspora plants little seeds across the empire. And so what you have is you get a, you get a Jewish or Christian community in Ephesia, in Ephesus, or in Cappadocia, or in Rome, or in Carthage. And you get all these little churches sprouting up, and all of a sudden, over the next period of 200 years, you get a network. And you, yeah. Paul, Paul's writings are circulating throughout the empire, and the epistles and the gospels are written. And then all of a sudden, you get Clement of Rome, you get Ignatius, then you get the uh, Valentinius, and then you have, and next thing you know, we have an entire Christian network all mm -hmm. across the empire, and the elites start to get involved. And when they yeah. get involved, Constantine's mother is one of these people, and the rest is history. What do you think about yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, well, for, for the uh, Christian Christianity was uh, for mo most Romans, it was an obscure religion that was usually followed by the you know the weak, so women, children, slaves, uneducated, and uh, also it was, it was seen as the SJW people. religion. It was seen as the SJW religion to them back then. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was I've just heard a Christian. Yeah, it was for the poor people. Yeah, and uh, it was it, when you, I think it was uh, Augustine of Hippo, which was one of the greatest writers of all time, who who said that he did not. He he was he was reading Cicero. All he was all he, yeah. he uh, had been always reading Cicero, and then he read the Bible, and he was, what the hell is that? I mean, this is. Bible is really simple to read yeah. uh, when you think about it. And this is why Romans loved or eventually um, uh, adopted Christianity or they became Christians because it was simple. It was those, Are it you? was, uh, yeah, uh, it was all these simple, simple rules that they followed. And this is what they wanted at the time. It was it was a time of crisis, the third, fourth century, 
they could not rely anymore on the Roman central government because they did not do much for them. And uh, this is why they wanted to have some, I, I, would, I would even say that those uh, Romans in the third and the fourth century and the fifth century were really depressed, but they saw the world around them collapsing. Right. And they needed some basic rules. They needed uh, guidance, and they did not get it from the from the from the government. This is why they uh, adopted uh, Christianity. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I want, but you, you mentioned Augustus of Hippo, so I wanted to play the clip from your channel in case anyone wants to get a taste. Yeah. Of it. And now, that and then I want, but I want to hold that thought. That's a really good point. I want, I want, I yeah. want to lose that thought. But here's here's your channel. Saint Aurelius Augustine of Hippo, the City of God, Book 14, Chapter 16. Although therefore lust may have many objects, yet when no object is specified, the word lust usually suggests to the mind the lustful excitement of the organs of generation. And this lust not only takes possession of the whole body, but also makes itself felt within, and moves the whole man with a passion in which mental emotion is mingled with bodily appetite, so that the pleasure which results is the greatest of all bodily pleasures. So possessing indeed is this pleasure, so that at the moment of time in which it is consummated, all mental activity is suspended. Even those who delight in this pleasure are not moved to it at their own will, whether they confine themselves to lawful or transgress to unlawful pleasures. But sometimes this lust importunes them in spite of themselves, and sometimes fails them when they desire to feel it. So that though lust rages in the mind, it stirs not in the body. Thus. So yeah, your channel, by the way, is... I did not expect that you were going to play this. Yeah, I have a couple of clips. I'll, I'll have two more that I want to show, but I don't want to get off topic. But I just I, I showed that because we were talking about it. But you made a good point, is that the the century, or the third century was a mess. I mean, yeah. it was a mess. But by the way, Constantine, or I'm sorry, not Constantine, um, Eusebius argues that Philip the Arab was actually the first actual... Yeah, Philip, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, do you do you agree with that? He was the first first Christian. Yeah, I think that uh, it probably is a myth, uh, or there is no historical evidence to support that he was the first Christian. I think that the reason why you think he was the first Christian is that he came from Arabia. We tend to think that you know Christianity is a Western religion, but for for the ancient Romans, it was, it was Eastern. Eastern religion. It came yeah. from the East, along with. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, hegemony of the east as i described it before so for them it was this it was you know all the cultural war, wars that we have today uh i don't know between um the uh, conservatives and liberals then back then it was between the west and the east right. and the east eventually won along with christianity yeah and so they looked at christianity as like this exotic eastern religion Sort yeah, of how, sort of how we would look at like Islam, I guess you would say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so, but it, it it caught on, especially in areas like Syria, Egypt, Carthage, and Turkey, and those places, Christianity just grew like 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 wildfire. Like it just yeah, and and there was that there was a lot of different kinds of Christianity. There was the not the Marcionism Christianity, which was like Gnosticism. And there was Pauline Christianity. There was uh, Ebionite Christianity, who were followers of James. And there was all these different kinds of groups. And they didn't really have a canon yet. They didn't have a, a doctrine or a creed yeah. until the fourth century. And that's when that's that's when they actually become. That's when Christianity actually becomes a power. It's yeah, no longer yeah. it's no longer just a religion that's exotic and cool and the new thing. It becomes the powerful movement for the rest of the history basically yeah all the branches that you mentioned this is really interesting for constantine because constantine eventually he was baptized so the question whether he adopted christianity out of uh, it was opportunism or he really believed in jesus christ i think both 
but for him it was of course important he was an emperor and he needed something unifying for the whole empire it is va uh, very diverse groups of people within the empire that could not be uh, united like racially so uh, of course and latin language was always struggling against greek language so he needed to find something to unite the empire and he picked christianity but he was as you mentioned there are all these different branches so he uh, hosted this uh, i think it was uh, in 325 three, 325 yeah he host, hosted this uh, uh, nicene uh, council yep. yeah council and he was sitting there and he was so surprised how all these Christians hated one another for all these different branches had these disputes over, I don't know, is, is, is the father, uh, the God equal to the, to the son or, or is the son that. subordinate or, and he was just sitting there and it's recording how pissed off he was that he picked this religion that he thought it's going to unify everyone. And he, he found out that they were bickering about things that he did not understand because Constantine above all was he, he was not a, he was not smart I wouldn't call him he, he wasn't smart but he not, he was not educated right he came from a poor background he uh he was a soldier uh above all so uh when he started to he when he heard all those theolog theological disputes he was like, "What? The, what? Are, what are you doing? I specific. I specifically told you to to unite my empire, and now you're sitting sitting right. here and bickering about nonsense." Right. And he and it's funny because you're right. He he's he's wondering why can't they just all just say they're both gods? But this was yeah. a big deal. This Trinity thing had to be fixed. Like they had to fix figure this thing out, and they ended up going with God, uh, Jesus, who is not the Father but also is God and God is not Jesus, but also is the father. And there was like this Trinity thing is that they're not equal to each other, but they're all equal to God. So yeah. this is fully man and fully God. So, okay. They finally flushed that out. So they write the Nicene Creed and then all the other Christians become heretics, not right away, but for the next like hundred years, yeah. Theodosius, yeah. Theodosius is the one who really says, okay, no more heretics. Mm -hmm. I'm killing all of you guys. I'm knocking down all your no more funding for anybody that's not a Nicene Pauline Christian with it believes yeah. in the Trinity. And that's the rest is history from then forward. But um Constantine, before that even happens, people don't realize this. This is a little forgotten thing in history. I'm sure you know about this. Constantine tries to make himself into like the Christ. He puts up a giant megalithic statue. Yeah, the head yeah. is like the size of a house. <laughs> And he tries to put this thing up there in front of Jesus and put Jesus below him. But I don't know what happened. What happens to that? It falls down or something? Whatever happens. Uh, I, I don't know if it's the same statue that I saw in Rome. It was enormous Gigantic. when I saw it. it was, oh, I, I, was, I, was, I was speechless when I saw it. it. The foot has a vein in it, right? Is it yeah. One? Yeah, that's the one. He, he tries to put it up behind the arch. And he wants to put Jesus on top of the arch and him behind the arch overpowering mm. jesus he wants to make himself bigger than jesus mm. but he never yeah, the, doesn't work yeah it doesn't work and uh i think well i would say that constantine the great might be the only emperor that uh christians kind of feared or yeah. they respected him enough to be okay we uh, they had you, no choice you, you well i think they had a choice because christians were molded by martyrism they, they were not afraid of Diocletian when he threatened them to kill them. Hey, uh, either you give up on your religion or I'm going to kill you. And Christians were so powerful because they were willing to sacrifice their lives uh, for, for, the, for their beliefs. Wow. And I think that Constantine the Great was the only emperor they were willing to, uh, you know, tell them, hey, I, you are a little bit like like something like a god okay you made us into a state's religion and we're gonna cut you some slack okay uh but that for example theodosius the great who really made christianity as a state's religion uh what happened in uh, Thess uh thessalonica in uh i think 387 that uh theodosius orders ordered all these people in a circus to be massacred I mean, tens of thousands of people were massacred and uh, Bishop uh, Ambrosius in Mediolanum ordered that, hey, hey, 
you you have you are okay you might be an emperor but you have sinned right and i will not allow you uh to go into my church and theodosius it was it was basically when if, if you get banned on twitter if you're a politician and you get banned on twitter you suddenly have no voice because uh all you know people moved from forums to churches right. churches became not only those holy places but also where people were haggling about um uh, about prices and so on uh, uh, deals were made in churches and suddenly emperor couldn't go to a church and uh church was so powerful that they uh could do that they could and it was theodosius he was the last uh emperor of the of the western and the eastern roman empire he was one of the strongest people on the planet at the time but the church was so powerful that they could tell him what to do and he needed and he then eventually uh repented for his sins that he did in Thessalonica. wow well the, the the last thing i want to get into is we we've been going for an hour now it's been really fun what yeah. I want to get into is I want to ask you when do you think Rome fell? Was it the fall of Rome, Rome, or was it the fall of Constantinople? Uh, I think the most important question we need to ask when asking this question is what was the Roman Empire? And the Roman Empire for many people was I don't know is it Latin language or the Colosseum? Why we talk about the Roman Empire even today? And the thing is that the Roman Empire was a superpower. Right. It was not and there were many many empires there were, it was british empire frankish empire napoleon uh german empire but uh all of them were one of the many they were not undisputed and the roman empire was <laughs> the only uh, the only empire that was un, uh that was undisputed it had no equal a counterpart right and why we uh so when we talk about when the roman empire ended i think the 476 is the great date for this uh, I agree, right. many of my, my those fans uh that i have uh, that uh, follow my channel are gonna kill me right now because they freaking I hate know. when i say I, 476 is the, i agree the, yeah but uh i think the byzantine is, period is a different thing it's a different entity it's I, a different i love byzantine empire me too, me too. But byzantine empire was one of the many it was uh, basically, the emperorship of uh, Byzantine Empire was challenged by Charlemagne in 800. He declared himself Roman Emperor, so there were two Roman Emperors at the time. Yeah, there was supposed to be an Empress, right? Yeah, and uh, in the Byzantine Empire there was an Empress at the time, so uh, Charlemagne thought, hey, man, she's just a woman. Uh, I think that there is a power, power vacuum. Bam, I'm, I'm the new Roman emperor. But uh, also the Byzantine Empire was fairly small and did, did not control the Mediterranean. So I think that uh, Never in 476, it's a symbolic date and people say, hey, did, nothing really happened in 476. You know, no one, nobody really noticed that the last Roman emperor, Romulus, was deposed. Uh, first of all, as someone who reads uh, a lot of history books, like contemporary history books, we are not able to comprehend what happens today. What what is important? Is it is the war in Ukraine important for the people that will live in five hundred years? Is it Corona? We don't know. Right. And this is what I when I read those books, there's always described thoroughly some war between uh, Byzantines and Sassanids, and those wars are not that important to us today. I mean, about uh, when uh, Caracalla granted uh, citizenships to all Roman citizens, it is almost neglected because it was one of the most important decisions that any emperor has ever uh, ever uh, done at this at, at that point. But it is not described why he why he did it. So we are not able to comprehend what happens today, what is important, what is of importance, and. Uh, at the same time, I think the 476 is the right date. We are uh, just because those people were not able to comprehend what was the historical importance of this event when uh, Romulus was deposed. It doesn't matter that uh, it doesn't mean that we should abandon this date. It was it was symbolic, but sim uh, uh, for history it's extremely important when something is symbolic. It was first obscure king was Romulus. The last obscure emperor was Romulus, and this and is why way, it's so Rob, important. And also his name 
In fact, his name is Romulus Augustus. Yeah. And more of a, even more ironic, because it's not only Romulus is the first king of Rome, but Augustus is the first emperor. Yeah. Rome. So Romulus Augustus, it ends on him. It's, it couldn't be a more perfect, more ironic ending. Yeah. But I agree. I think at that point in time, the Eastern Byzantine period is a different thing. It's a different entity, different religion, different everything. And not only that, they don't, they're not a, they're not, like, like you said, they're not a powerful military like the Romans were. They were sort of a, on, on the defense. They built yeah. walls. They didn't go and invade. They built their walls. And they were the ones getting invaded by the people in, in mm. Germans, by the Ottomans. And, and, and here's, an, here's another big thing that I, I like to bring up when I get into this discussion. Is what did the, when the Crusades went down, who did Rome go and attack? They went to attack the Byzantines. Yeah. Look at the Byzantines as <laughs> another enemy of the Crusades. Yeah. So that's yeah. how you know that they're not the same thing. They're two different entities, and that's it's it's too bad, but that's the way it was. Yeah, but uh, 1453, when the Constantinople, Constantinople was uh, conquered by by Ottomans, it is it is uh, also a great event, unlike 476. Because in 476, just one obscure emperor that was unrecognized by the Eastern counterpart in uh, Constantinople, uh, it's it's in a you know uneventful year for for the people that live in 476. But 15, 50, uh, 1453, when Constantinople was conquered, it was a widespread event that many uh, many people were aware how important it was, yeah. and it was a great battle. It was an awesome battle, you know, Battle of Constantinople. There was a, there was a lunar and, eclipse and the moon turned red. The yeah, yeah. The day the Constantinople fell, for three days, the moon was red and there was an eclipse. Can you yeah. imagine seeing that on the day? Yeah, the yeah. It's mind-blowing stuff. Yeah, and this is why people love uh, Battle of Constantinople and they tend to think that this is when the Roman Empire ended because it's such an epic event that happened. But historically... You need, I think it, it not holds together well when historically it's, it's a, it's an awesome event, but I tend to think that Roman empire started with uh, Romulus and ended with Romulus and Eastern Roman empire or Byzantine empire started with Constantine who, who founded Constantinople and ended with Constantine. Uh, I don't know what, what, what his number was, uh, that it was fell in, in 1453. Or, no, I think it's 10 actually. I don't know, it's either ten or twelve. But, yeah, yeah, but yeah, there was a there was an oracle about Constantine. Uh, it'll start on Constantine and then Constantine. But um, I was going to ask you about because in twelve fifty three, the Constantinople gets destroyed by the Romans and the West, and a lot of the, a lot of the or a lot of the Christians that were living in Constantinople. I think it was 1206. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, you're right, right. I'm wrong about the date. But yeah, 13th century. A lot of the Christians that are living in Constantinople, from between that period and when it actually fell, fell in the 15th century, they start fleeing to the north into Crimea, into Ukraine, and yeah. Russia. And they start the, what, the when they get that, well, I forgot, the, I forgot the, the Russian's name, they get him to, con to convert to Christianity. And then what they do is, yeah. They start moving the church towards. I've heard from from theologians and historians of the church that you can make a case that the Church of Byzantine eventually migrates into the Russian Orthodox Church. But today's Russian Orthodox Church is a remnant of the old Byzantine Church. That's yeah, I'm exactly, exactly. Of course, Greeks have their own church as, as well today. But uh, yeah, it's true that Russians think of themselves as the third Rome. Yep. First one, first Rome was Rome, the second was Constantinople, and Moscow is allegedly the, the, the third Rome. And then you have uh, the Holy Roman Empire too, so it's really like, it's, it's all, it's Ro everyone just wants to be Rome. Everyone loves Rome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is why the Roman Empire was so important, that everyone uh everyone wanted to become the roman empire for between 476 when the roman empire collapsed and 1945 uh, the destruction of uh, nazi germany every single state yeah. aspired to be the roman empire not literally that, that they did not wear togas necessarily right. uh but they called themselves emperors uh they 
and what but the most important what they, what they try to achieve to be the hegemon in Europe. But you know what's crazy? And no other nation has ever managed to be the uh, the superpower in Europe. Always it was for Europe has all since 476 Europe has always been fragmented and no ruler no empire has ever managed to uh managed to overcome that but you, but you know what the kicker is the biggest the reason why Rome is not a failure and is a, is a giant success in the timeline of history is look at the language that we're using it's it's English it is Germanic but look mm. at our alphabet the Latin alphabet a yeah. c d so we are the children of Rome, whether we like it or not. We're this, all of Europe, all of the West, all of America, all of, I mean, like, we're all basically descendants of what Rome, Rome really was the West. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like, whether we like it or not, Rome was a success. And we are just, you know, we are the children of Rome, basically, you know? Yeah, yeah. This is why uh, I created a video when where I discuss, uh, it's, it's it not holds together where historically, but I knew that from from the beginning it's it's not gonna be historically accurate. But I just uh, I compare the United States and the Roman Empire. Yeah, I, and I believe that, that no yeah. other nation on earth has so much power in the hands since the days of Rome, and, and the United States has this this amount of power that the Roman Empire uh, and I, had. And I think that you made a good point is when you we talk about the military, because what yeah. makes you, what makes the United States. A key player is that when when the United Nations needs help, who do they call for the military? The United, yeah, United, you know what I'm saying, United States, and that's how it was in the ancient days of Rome. Like you know, when the people are on the Black Sea region in Pontus or Armenia hmm. needed help, they would go to Rome, and Rome would come in, and and that's how it was. And it's the same sort of situation you see today. And I was just thinking of something too, and we can we can end up on this. This will be the last thing we talk yeah. about. Um, Julian the Apostate. I wonder if he was successful and he actually, let's say he actually does re regain the Roman empire the way he does. And then he goes into Babylon and conquers Babylon and then goes back triumphantly. Do you think that changes? Do you think in that case, then the Roman empire is back? I, I don't think it, uh, the empire would go back, uh, because the, the people adopted the Christianity at their own will. And it was not because emperor wanted them to, to do that. And if Julian, it was just some intermezzo with, with Julian, but it wasn't really of that great importance for the, for the Roman empire, for, for the Roman citizens, Roman citizens were really, uh, living in a time of crisis. They needed some, uh, certainty, certainty in their, in their lives and Christianity gave them this this certainty and for example uh i think john chrysostomos says and this is the video that i'm planning to do why christianity went viral and uh, john chrysostomos claims hey when you go to a marketplace you should look calm you uh should look under control you your feet move, feet should not move undisciplined uh you should your mouth should utter words calmly because everyone was in such a hurry and everyone was kind of panicking at the time and christians looked like they they, they don't give a damn they don't yeah. give a shit about the, the the crisis that happens in the world so this is why christianity was so popular because people wanted to become christians they, they wanted to have a peaceful state of mind and it's like it's like it brings stoicism to the masses with a with an actual thing to believe in rather than just plain stoicism which only really smart philosophers would get into mm -hmm. Christianity sort of makes you a stoic by default. Yeah. Worshiping what you become, what you worship. So, yeah, I think it's, I think that's what made Christianity so big was what you said. The people will get like the virtues behind it. They like the certainty of knowing that I'm going to go into paradise just by believing in Jesus rather than, mm -hmm. rather than, Oh, I don't know if I'm gonna go to Hades. I don't know if I'm going to be, well, I don't know what Zeus is going to do to me. Who knows? Zeus is in control. But like, mm. but like in Christianity, you have a clear and concise theology, and I think I think you're right about that. Yeah, what, what people also tend to forget that uh, as we today talk about how elites are out of touch with uh, common people, then pagans who were the elites at the time also got uh, last with uh, in touch with uh, with the common people. So 
we, we tend to think, oh, Christianity destroyed pagans, but pagans were, I would say, out of touch. They they went to they went to circuses, they went to theater plays, who, I by know. the way, were always considered a sign of a degeneracy, even at the time yeah. uh, the Roman Empire existed. So. And some again, there was a power vacuum. Uh, people needed some some beliefs, and Christianity was there for them. And pagans abandoned the common people. Yeah, and Dionysus was like the he became the most important god later on, and it, he was all about bacchic frenzies and getting yeah. drunk on wine. People people wanted uh, virtue. They wanted uh, you know something to bring their lives something better rather than. That's Di the Dionysus, the, the illusion and mysteries. It was good for elites who have money and wealth who can just drink all day, but mm -hmm. not for, like you said, for the poor people, for the people who are, you know, downtrodden, and for the soldier class. Christianity was where it's at. Because yeah, yeah. Salvation. And that's what they're looking for salvation, like you said. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, pagans abandoned those people and they did not want to do anything. They were. I, yeah, they were so out of touch. They were they became obscure, and they were not there for them when people needed them. And this is why people abandoned paganism, and they you know, find, found it, it, it's interesting because it, most of it, what what we say here, it's uh, just our theories. Why did it happen? It's so interesting because you have no contemporary analysis why people uh, adopted Christianity, why they joined the church. It was so interesting that you have these masses of millions of people who abandon the, the old gods and they join the Christian church. But there is no contemporary analysis telling us why did it happen. It's all our theories. And when you have election today, then it's always, oh, people vote Republicans because uh, reason number A and they vote Democrats for reason number B. This all those analysis, but it's so right. uh, uh, frustrating that nobody yeah. at the time bothered to do analysis why people are uh, converting to Christianity. Yeah, that's a really good point. And so when we, before we close out, I want to play a couple clips. I'll play, I'll do some, these ones will be shorter. I got some clips that I wanted, that I picked out from your channel. And um, anyone who's watching, go and subscribe to Thomas Maximus. It pops right up in the YouTube search. It'll come right up. It's not that hard to find. Uh, you'll see the symbol. You see the helmet. You'll see it. And uh, so let's do this one first. Let's do the ancient Rome trip. Let's do this one first. video is a guide of ancient Italy and its places that I visited in August 2021. The video contains offensive language and should not be taken super seriously. I started my trip by crossing the Alps as Hannibal did over 2000 years ago. But unlike him I didn't want to destroy Rome, but rather explore its glories. I started my journey in Brescia. It's a small Italian city in the northern Italy with some uh, interesting monuments like Capitoline Temple. But the truth is I went to Brescia for something else. The only preserved bust of Roman Emperor Aurelian that probably exists. The Santa Giulia Museum has also one of the creepiest statues that I have ever seen in my entire life. Oh my god, what's wrong with your face? Next up, Rome. Or Roma, as natives would say. By the way, I don't know.
On the Palatine Hill you can also find a very special museum built by you know who. This is a column of Trajan, which depicts some pretty brutal scenes from his Dacian campaigns in the second century. A uh, fun fact, the shape of Trajan's column is actually formed by the real life size of Trajan's genitalia. Further up north we have Pantheon, one of the most preserved Roman buildings, mainly due to the fact that its concrete contains volcanic ash and also was frequently used as a church since the 7th century, when Pantheon was gifted to Pope by Eastern Emperor of <laughs> by Eastern Emperor of <laughs> Fakas. <laughs> Eastern Emperor Fakas. Well, I guess Emperor Fakas wouldn't really like Emperor Poopy Anus. <laughs> In 326, the great Constantine was on his way to the Eternal City to celebrate his 20th anniversary of his accession to power. He had just defeated Eastern Emperor Licinius and became after the long 40 years a sole emperor of the Roman Empire. However, on his way to Rome he suddenly ordered an execution of his firstborn son and heir Crispus. Crispus wife Helena and their son then suddenly disappeared. A couple of days later Constantine's wife and Crispus stepmother Fausta was killed by Constantine as well by being hurled into a boiling bath. After the massacre, all victims were subjugated to damnation memoriae, condemnation of memory. Just a week before, Crispus was an heir to the Roman throne and a favorite son of Constantine, and Fausta an undisputed empress. A week after, they were both dead. Their names were removed from inscriptions and their statues were destroyed. To other, their names would be a death sentence. So what the hell happened? And why? Given the damnation memoriae, we have zero literal sources from the time, so we need to rely on authors that lived much later. And by merging all literal sources, we can create two theories that tell us what might have happened. Theory number one, Fausta manipulated Constantine into killing Crispus. One theory states, Fausta plotted against Crispus to ensure that her three own sons she had with Constantine become the only heirs to the imperial throne. She convinced Constantine that his son Crispus was plotting against him and outraged Constantine, who was known for his short temper, immediately executed his son. But Constantine's mother, Saint Helena, enraged by the death of her grandson, persuaded Constantine that Fausta had lied about the plot, so outraged Constantine then killed his wife as well by throwing her into a hot bath. This is the first yeah, Fausta. So to watch the rest of that, go to Thomas Maximus. It is a great channel. You do a lot of really, really good editing, really good editing, and your memes are on point, dude. Your <laughs> memes are great. So I will give you thanks. That. And um, yeah, so. Like I said, uh, I'll have to fix those uh, edit audios and put the visuals over it. That'll take me two seconds to do that. Um, but yeah, anything else you want to talk about while you're anything you want to promote while you're here? Uh, I I think that uh, just you know just my channel and whatever. Just stay safe out there. And uh, when you want to join the military, you should join the military. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Because uh, this is what this is what Roman Empire was for me. That I uh, eventually joined the military. Uh, oh, nice. this is how important for me it was uh, to read read a book. So uh, I think it for me it is out of this world experience. If you want to pursue and uh, get this same amount of experience as I have, then go for it. Are you a Macedonian? Nope. Okay, you, but you don't want to say where you're at. Uh, yeah, I, I I will tell you off the record, by the way. Okay. All right, all right. Yeah. I, I I was just gonna say just for uh, just for. Shitsy giggles. He's he's a Macedonian. He's from the part of Macedonia. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. But um, yeah, no, this has been great. And um, like I always say at the end of my shows, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.